Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Rebecca Decker, and in this video, we're going to talk about the impact of epidurals for pain management during labor on the second stage or pushing phase of labor. Hi everyone, in today's video, we're going to talk about the effects of epidurals on the second stage of labor. If you followed EBV, we have another video all about the effectiveness, benefits, and risks of epidurals for pain management during labor. And in this video, we're gonna take a closer look at the impact of epidurals on the second stage or pushing phase of labor. The second stage of labor begins when the cervix is fully dilated and it includes the pushing phase when you're pushing the baby through the pelvis and it ends when the baby's body is born. Now this is an important topic when we talk about the length of the second stage because longer second stages have been linked in the research with poor health outcomes, including a higher risk of postpartum infection, a higher risk of having a severe perineal tear, a higher risk of postpartum hemorrhage, postpartum fever, or needing a forceps, vacuum delivery, or cesarean. So why might we be concerned about the impact of an epidural on the second stage of labor? Well, researchers have suggested that epidurals could hamper your pushing efforts by reducing the effectiveness of your pushing or your uterine contractions during the pushing phase. And one of the ways this might happen is because the nerves in your pelvic floor and the bottom of your pelvis may be numbed or their feelings may be lessened by the epidural block. Now, one of the things a lot of people don't know about birth is that as the baby's head descends through the pelvis and puts pressure on your cervix, where the baby's gonna come out, there is a complex network of nerves there that then feed back to the brain. So the baby's head presses on the cervix, the nerves send messages to your brain, your brain releases oxytocin, which is the hormone that encourages and strengthens your contractions even more, which push the baby down more, put more pressure on the cervix. And so this is a constant feedback loop called the utero-pituitary reflex. So epidurals can interfere with that feedback loop. And it's also possible that epidurals might relax some of the muscles of the pelvic floor, which may have some kind of an impact on the baby's ability to rotate and come out through the pelvis. So what have researchers found about the impacts of epidurals on the second stage of labor? So we know theoretically it could have an impact. Well, many, many studies over decades have found over and over again that epidurals are linked to a longer second stage of labor. This has been demonstrated in many observational studies as well as randomized controlled trials where some people have epidurals and some people do not. And though there have not been very many recent studies on this topic, I'm going to talk about a few. The first study I want to talk about was published in 2020. This was a meta-analysis where they combined 13 observational studies that included more than 337,000 birthing people from around the world. These researchers found that when participants had an epidural, they had five times the odds of experiencing a prolonged second stage of labor. Their definition for prolonged second stage of labor was different in different studies. However, most of the researchers defined a prolonged second stage as more than three hours for someone with an epidural who was giving birth for the first time, and more than two hours for someone with an epidural who had given birth before. They also found that those who had a prolonged second stage had more than five times the odds of needing a forceps or vacuum assisted delivery. A smaller study was published in 2023 and I wanted to point this one out because it's too new to be included in that meta-analysis. This study was conducted in China and they were reviewing patient medical records to divide people into one of two groups, the group that had epidurals during labor and the group that didn't. They were only looking at low-risk women who were pregnant with a single baby. Their labors began spontaneously, so they were not induced, and their baby was in the head down position and they were preparing to have a vaginal birth. Now, the study was a little bit smaller. There were 246 people in the epidural group and 226 in the non-epidural group. They found that those who had an epidural 
had a longer second stage of labor, which was about 79 minutes compared to 57 minutes in the non-epidural group. However, they did not find any differences between groups in cesarean rates. There's also an older Cochrane review, last updated in 2018, that looked at 40 randomized controlled trials on epidurals, comparing epidurals to either other methods of pain relief or no pain relief at all. And this study had about 11,000 participants when they combined all of the studies together. They found that the second stage of labor was longer by about 15 minutes for those with an epidural. And just like the study I mentioned from China, they did not find any increased risk of cesarean with epidurals. There's one more study I wanna mention. This came out in 2017, and I still get a lot of questions about the study because it came out with headlines saying things like, epidurals don't necessarily slow labor. So why would the study show that epidurals do not slow labor when I just told you that we have decades of research showing that it does slow labor down? Well, the study that these news articles were talking about it also took place in China in the year 2015, and it was published in 2017. And the participants in this study were first-time mothers giving birth at term to a single baby. They all went into labor spontaneously, so none of them were induced, and they all requested epidurals. So everybody in the study had an epidural. Everyone received a low dose of medication in their epidurals, and at the start of the pushing phase, or the second stage of labor, they had already been receiving the epidural all the way up until that point. Then when they reached the second stage or the pushing phase of labor, 178 of them were randomly assigned to continue to receive the epidural, but only saline or salt water was being pumped through it. And 171 were randomly assigned to continue receiving the low dose of medication through the epidural. Both the care providers and the patients were blinded, meaning that they did not know if they were receiving the salt water or the medications during the second stage of labor. So what did they find? Well, they found that the length of the pushing phase was similar in both groups. It was on average about 51 to 52 minutes of pushing and rates of vaginal birth were similar between the two groups, about 97 to 99%. It's also interesting to note that the pain scores were almost identical between the two groups. So what this means is that the group who was still receiving the epidural medications and the group whose epidural medications were turned off were still being impacted by the medications. This is because ropivacaine is the particular medication they were using to numb people through the epidural. And this is a long acting drug that lasts about on average four hours in your body. So even though they had turned the epidural off for half the people in the study, the medications were still in their system. So this particular study was not comparing epidural to no epidural. It was looking at the effects of turning off the epidural at the start of the second stage with the specific medication that they were using. And basically they found that because that medication remained in everyone's body, turning off the epidural in the second stage probably didn't have any effect on the length of the second stage in this study with this particular medication. So it's always helpful when you read study headlines or news headlines that say things like, new study proves, you have to look at the research. You can't just read the summary. So you also need to look at all of the evidence leading up to that point. And it can be helpful to download that specific article, read it, you know, send it to us at EPB and ask if we can cover it on our podcast. You have to look at the methods of how they carried out the study, including the limitations of the study. And a lot of people were tricked by this headline. They thought that this meant epidurals do not lengthen the second stage of labor, but that's not even what the study was looking at, so and that's not what they found. So given that we know that epidurals can lengthen the second stage of labor, it might be helpful to look at professional recommendations to see what are organizations saying about this phenomenon and how we should help people who are having longer labors with epidurals. The American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, also known as ACOG, released recommendations in early 2024 about managing labor and what they call labor arrest. And they defined prolonged second stage of labor as more than three hours of pushing in someone who's giving birth for the first time 
or more than two hours of pushing in someone who has previously given birth before. And when it comes to actually diagnosing what they call labor arrest, which kind of means labor has stopped or is not progressing, they recommend an individualized approach rather than a one size fits all definition. And that the diagnosis of labor arrest should take into consideration several factors, including the birthing person's preferences for their labor and birth, their labor progress, and factors in the birth setting that might impact their ability or likelihood of being able to give birth vaginally, including the risks and benefits of different interventions that are available. If arrest in the second stage of labor is diagnosed, they recommend that the care provider who's attending the birth consider using forceps or vacuum before resorting to a cesarean. And we cover that in a different podcast episode, which I'll link to in the show notes. I also wanted to note that ACOG currently recommends that you begin pushing when your cervix is fully dilated rather than waiting or delaying pushing, sometimes known as laboring down. Now, this is a controversial topic in the birth world, and I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole right now. That is a topic for a different day, but I just wanted to let you know that there are differing opinions on this topic. Some care providers still prefer delaying pushing for a little bit because they feel like it lessens exhaustion or has other benefits, but currently ACOG does not recommend delayed pushing or laboring down if you have an epidural. The National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, or NICE, in the United Kingdom provides clinical practice guidelines as well. They updated their recommendations for care during labor in 2023, and they split up the second stage into two phases, the passive and the active phase of the second stage of labor. The passive phase begins when the cervix is fully dilated, but before any pushing has started. So someone who has an epidural who's giving birth for the first time might wait up to two hours after full dilation to begin pushing, while someone who has given birth before and has an epidural might wait up to one hour before they begin pushing after they're fully dilated. So again, this is what I was talking about earlier, the laboring down or the delayed pushing. NICE bases their recommendation on delayed pushing on evidence that it might lower the risk of unplanned cesarean, lower the risk of needing vacuum or forceps in those who have given birth before, and shorten the length of the active phase or the time that you're actually spending pushing. They state that the active phase of the second stage begins when the baby is visible or crowning, or when the cervix is fully dilated and pushing has started. NICE identifies delays in the second stage as more than three hours of pushing in the active phase if you're giving birth for the first time, and more than two hours of pushing in the active phase if you've given birth before. I wanna let you know if you wanna learn more about the phenomenon of failure to progress or prolonged labor. We have a signature article and podcast all about this topic at EBB called the evidence on failure to progress. And we also have a companion article about prolonged second stages of labor. And you can also learn more about birthing positions and their impact on the length of the pushing phase in our signature article, the evidence on birthing positions. So what's the bottom line? The bottom line is that epidurals can impact the second stage of labor, but that does not mean that you have to have a cesarean birth or that you're at higher risk for cesarean. Important factors include having a care provider who is aware of the guidelines, who knows about how epidurals might lengthen the second stage, and who provides individualized care for you. Go to our Failure to Progress article to learn more about these different guidelines, and we have tables and everything explaining what the guidelines recommend for prolonged first and second stages of labor. And make sure you check out our other videos on birthing positions. Those are some of the most popular videos on this YouTube channel. And you can also look through our other videos on pain management during labor. So I hope you found this information helpful and empowering. And don't forget to like and subscribe so that you're notified when our next video comes out. And I'll see you in the next one.